Welcome to the Shepherd's Chapel Network Family Bible Study Hour with Pastor Arnold Murray. Wisdom is understanding God's Word. Pastor Murray's unique teaching approach brings God's Word alive with meaning as he takes you on a chapter-by-chapter, verse-by-verse study of God's letter to you, the Bible. And now here is Pastor Arnold Murray. Good day to you. God bless you. Say welcome to the Shepherd's Chapel. Welcome to this family Bible study hour. New book today, Habakkuk. Um, Habakkuk means in the Hebrew tongue to embrace. What you want to be careful of, little is known about him other than he is a prophet. And he was a prophet to Judah. Uh, Israel, the ten tribes, have already been taken captive by the Assyrian, or are about to be. And Father, through this prophet, is letting Judah know they're not getting off the hook. They're going to be taken captive by the king of Babylon. So it is good to embrace, but you want to be careful who you're embracing. Because this goes all the way to the Antichrist. You might embrace him, thinking you were embracing Almighty God through the Son. So uh, Habakkuk probably was written with a hundred and year a correction about 515 okay so uh, and no more need be said about it let's let's get into it Habakkuk chapter 1 verse 1 the burden or the oracle which Habakkuk the prophet did see so here we know he one thing he is a prophet you don't know really where he came from other than to Judah from Judah probably but who his father was, we'll see. Verse 2, O Lord, how long shall I cry, and thou wilt not hear? Even cry out unto thee of violence, and thou wilt not save. In other words, your people are going amuck. They're running amuck. And I cry as a prophet. I try to teach. I try to cry out. You're not answering, and they're sure not listening. Verse 3, Why dost thou show me iniquity, and cause me to behold grievance? For spoiling and violence are before me, and there are that raise up strife and contention. And so it is. Um, uh, will, will this always be with us? Is what, what he's saying here. Verse 4, Therefore the law is slacked, and judgment doth never go forth. For the wicked doth compass about the righteous. They swarm them. Therefore wrong judgment proceedeth. Uh, this word wicked, you with companion Bibles, you're blessed, because you will note that this is Russia, which means it even goes forward and looks forward to the coming of the Antichrist, okay? the chief wicked one. This is why I would say, and this won't be the last time in this book he'll be singled out. That's why you want to be real careful about who you embrace, that you know who you're embracing. Well, how do I know that? By knowing the truth. Because wrong judgment will come forth when you are judged by people that have no common sense as to what our Father would say or have us do or simply to do justice, that is to say, to do what is right for the people. And uh, what he's saying here, this prophet, it's all around us. We can't even get a decent decision passed down. Verse 5, Behold ye among the heathen, and regard and wonder marvelously, for I will work a work in your days, which you will not believe, though it be told you. And that work is, of course, we look forward even to the end times when God would bring that work forth, that people would begin to believe, people would be fed, the old bones would be prophesied to, and truth would come back into them, and life would begin to, to come forth from the four winds just before the end, as it's written in Ezekiel 37. Verse 6, For lo, I, this is our Father speaking here, I raise up the Chaldeans, that's Babylon, okay, 
that bitter and hasty nation which shall march through the breadth of the land to possess the dwelling places that are not theirs. In other words, um, uh, here comes Nebuchadnezzar, here comes his troops. They're going to take Judah just as the ten tribes that were north were taken by the Assyrian. Our father always corrects his children, but then sometimes when the enemy, who, who is the king of Babylon to us in this generation? Satan himself. The king of Babylon of the great book of Revelation, which applies to us now, is none other than Satan himself. And you, you never want to be, you never want to miss that because that work that God produces is a work that allows deception if you're taken in with it. And in um, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, God says, if they want to believe a lie, I'll send them strong delusion. They can count on it. That's why you want to stick with your Father's Word. And so it is. Verse 7. They are terrible, speaking of the Chaldeans, the, the Babylonians, and dreadful. Their judgment and their dignity shall proceed of themselves. Uh, they do exactly what they want to do, and they have the power and the will to do it. This is why their, their weapon in these end times is deception. And whole nations are swarmed and netted in by that deception. They swallow it hook, line, and sinker. Verse 8, their horses also are swifter than the leopards and are more furious <clears throat> excuse me, than the evening wolves. They're keener. And their horsemen shall spread themselves, and their horsemen shall come from far. They shall fly as the eagle that hasteth to eat. Um, this, of course, uh, when it comes from wide and far, it's one worldism. Okay. It's going to happen, beloved. It is written, our Father has spoken it, and so it is that that one worldism shall come. It, through what? Deception, basically. Verse 9, they shall come all for violence. Their faces shall sup up as the east wind, and they shall gather the captivity as the sand. In other words, their very faces are so emotionally and, and geared to, as, as uh, flushed as the east wind to, to, in interest of what they're doing to destroy, to deceive, and they take captivity as you would the sands of the sea, that many. This is why you don't have to wonder when you read in the great book of Revelation that the whole world wonders after the Antichrist, the beast, that system. Verse 10, And they shall scoff at the kings, and the princes shall be a scorn unto them. They shall deride every stronghold, for they shall heap dust and take it. All they have to do is, if there's a wall built there, they'll push dirt up until they can just walk over it. That's how they take things. And, and that's the way deception works. This is why you want to remember one thing. You want to remember Jericho. And you want to remember how we take walls. Okay. How that God's truth, seven times around, and the sound of God's trumpet, the, the Word of God, brings down the enemy's wall. That's the work God will produce in these end times. You want to be geared for it. Verse 11, Then shall his mind change, and he shall pass over and offend, imputing this his power unto his God. We're, we're going to turn this all to religion false teachings, God is with us. Satan always likes to play God, okay? Verse 12, Art thou not from everlasting, O Lord God, mine holy one? We shall not die, O Lord. Thou hast ordained them for judgment, and, O mighty God, thou hast established them for correction. Um, as... Um, with Babylon in the end times, so it shall be. God's going to correct them. 
You can count on it. But he's going to give some free reign to those that are ignorant of God's word. If you are part of God's truth, you don't, or if you have absorbed God's truth, if you're familiar with it, God is your strength. And you're going to learn to depend on that strength because you're going to need it with what's about to happen. Verse 13, Thou art of pure eyes than to behold evil, and canst not look on iniquity. Wherefore lookest thou upon them that deal treacherously, and holdest thy tongue when the wicked devour the man that is more righteous than he. This word wicked again is Russia, meaning the old Antichrist. Why are you letting it happen? God lets it happen because it is a test. Quite frankly, a test to find out who has utilized common sense and who has not. Who has understood the simplicity in which Christ teaches and complicated into babble or confusion by man's traditions, by listening to man. Um, unfortunately, this false one has a message. You don't have to understand God's word. This is his message. We're going to fly away. You're going to be gone. You don't need the gospel armor on and in place to stand against the fiery darts of Satan because Satan's going to hop you in his bed and fly away with you. And you're going to think you're with the Lord and you're in bed with Satan. That's the deception. That's how he works. Makes it just as it, he changed it back in verse 11 to religion. You can read of that same religious one in Revelation chapter 13, verse 11. You know what he looked like? Looked like the lamb slain. Looked like the Lord Jesus Christ. Even had the two horns. But he had the voice of the dragon because he was the dragon. He was Satan. He was Lucifer. 14. And make us men, and this, this word men here is Adam, okay? The children of Adam. And make us men as the fishes, fish of the sea, as the creeping things. They have no ruler over them. Little old swarms just go here and go there and everything. And um, uh, this is how he uses them. By conning them, lying to them, and... What he's about to do, we'll understand in the next verse, 15. They take up all of them with the angle. They catch them in their net, sane, and gather them in their drag, and this word is sane. Therefore, they rejoice and are glad. They swoop up the little old Christians as fish. It is ironic, is it not, that that be the symbol of Christianity, which is the, the, the uh, cipher when you spell fish in the Greek tongue, Jesus Christ, Savior of Israel. Okay. And, um, so, and so it is. He is Savior. That's his job. That's his obligation. The little fishes swim right into the net and are caught and entrapped. You want to be careful who you embrace, my friend. Well, how can I be sure? By understanding the Word of God. What, why do you think God would give us this warning? Because He has some time to waste? Absolutely not. He gives the warning because He does not wish that you be deceived. He does not wish that you be ignorant concerning the end time events as he has promised you, they will transpire. It is written, and so it is. One big sweep over all the people, and they'll all say, Amen, Amen. Because they don't know any better. Why? They haven't been taught chapter by chapter and verse by verse to understand what God has to say. But rather, they listen to people that come and Jesus' name claiming to be Christian, but they never really get around to teaching the words of Christ, all of them. Verse 16, therefore they sacrifice unto their net. Okay. 
and burn incense unto their drag. Because that's a, that is a saying, okay? <clears throat> because by them, their portion is fat and their meat plenteous uh, because they worship the God of forces. And you know, people always go, they say, well, it's the majority, it must be right. And the majority has been wrong since the beginning of time. Verse 17, shall they therefore empty their net and not spare continually to slay the nations through their one worldism? They're going to keep fishing, my friend. <clears throat> That's his purpose, is to overcome. And he has, since the first earth age, when he was supposed to be the cherubim that protecteth, wanted that mercy seat. And as it is written in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, that's where he intends to sit. That's your New Testament telling you the end is not going to happen until after the false Christ sits in Jerusalem claiming to be God. What are you going to do about it? He's casting out that net of deception to drag in illiterate, biblically illiterate people. That's why you want to have the seal of God in your forehead, which is to say His word, His truth, so that you don't believe a lie. Chapter 2, verse 1. I will stand upon my watch and set me upon the tower and will watch to see what He will say unto me and what God will answer and what I shall answer when I am reproved. Um, what is a watchman supposed to be doing? Watching for the enemy. Watching and observing what happens. That's what you are in these end times as a watchman whereby you see even through current events the, trans the things transpire even that are written in the Word of God. Verse 2, And the Lord answered me, and He said, Write the vision and make it plain upon tables. You make a huge sign that he may run that readeth it. You, you make this sign and you give that warning, watchman, so that people can run when they see the Antichrist coming, when they know the lie is about to happen, so they're not involved within it, so they can continue doing God's work, therefore drawing strength from God and not being deceived. In other words, God wants His people to be warned. You got it? it? He loves His children, and He would far rather that they listen to Him than they would the liar with the net. Isn't it strange how some people prefer the net? Because they're ignorant. Verse 3, For the vision is yet for an appointed time, but at the end it shall speak and not lie. That's the end of time. It's going to happen. You're in that generation, my friend. Though it tarry, wait for it, because it will surely come. It will not tarry. You can count on it. It is written. It shall come to pass exactly that way. And do you know something? It's just exactly that simple. The Antichrist comes first. He has total power over communication, over uh, lecturing, and over pulpits, as far as that's concerned, the majority of them. Certainly not those that truth is taught from. And much of the world will be deceived. But God wanted you to hear the truth. And He wants you to wait for the true Christ. Not this Rasha, not this false one. Verse 4, Behold, his soul, which is lifted up, is not upright in him, but the just shall live by his faith. The, um, uh, they believe not and they live not. You believe and you live. I'm going to say that again. They believe not and they live not, but you believe and you will live. Why? Because you have eternal life through the Christ. That's your faith. Don't ever turn loose of it. Verse 5. 
Yea, also because he transgressed by wine. And this, what's more? He transgressed by wine. He is a proud man. And here, the word man is geber. Okay. And you should know what geber means. Okay. Neither keepeth at home who enlargeth his desire. That's soul, nefesh. His soul. As hell. And is as death. And cannot be satisfied, but gathereth unto him all nations, and heapeth upon him all people, all but the elect. Beloved, that's called one worldism, and one worldism it shall be. That one worldism is a surety. You can count on it. At the same time, let that let that forewarn you of the numerous people that will be involved within it. And do not let that sway you. It doesn't matter how many listen to the lies, the fact that you listen to the truth, believe and live. And they don't listen to the truth, they don't believe, and they die. Well, but we, we all believe, we believe too, we're gonna fly away. And you're gonna ride into the net, okay? Have, have a good flight, buddy. I mean, Satan's waiting for you, and he loves it. God would write in Ezekiel chapter 13, I am against those that teach my children to fly to save their souls. I don't know, have you ever read the Word of God? Do you listen to him, or do you listen to some pulpit squeak? Verse 6, just making friends and influencing people here, okay? You know, your soul depends on this. It's important. Verse 6, Shall not all these take up a parable against him? Do you know what that parable is, beloved? And a taunting proverb? Do you know what that proverb is? Against him and say, Woe to him that increaseth that which is not his. How long, question. And to him that ladeth himself with thick clay. You know, Christ walked the earth in a clay body, okay. born of woman. The Antichrist can put on all the thick clay he wants to and claim to be Messiah. He's not. He's a fake. Okay. It won't happen. He's not an earth man. This is why that Geber is utilized. You want to remember, well, but what about this proverb? Have you ever heard it before? Surely you have. It's recorded in Ezekiel chapter 14. And we can pick it up with um, verse 4 of Ezekiel 14. Listen to it. They, that thou shalt take up this proverb against the king of Babylon. Well, who's that? Well, you'll find out here in a minute, okay? And say, how hath the oppressor ceased, the golden city ceased? How could that be? This is the proverb. Five, the Lord hath broken the staff of the wicked and the scepter of the rulers, and our Lord will do that. Six, he who smote the people in wrath with a continual stroke, he that ruleth the nations in anger is persecuted, and none hindereth him. Isaiah 14, verse 5, listen carefully. Verse 7 now. The whole earth is at rest and is quiet. They break forth into singing, into singing thanksgiving. Do you know who this is that's singing? No, it's those that have eyes to see and ears to hear. Those that have the seal of God in their forehead as it is written in Revelation chapter 9, verse 4. Yea, the fir trees rejoice at thee and the cedars of Lebanon, saying, Shall, uh, since thou art laid down, no feller has come up against us. And uh, there, there is so much in that I won't even uh, go there. Well, I will a bit, okay. Satan always wanted to be a great cedar of Lebanon. But as it's written in the Masara documenting it, if you've studied with me in Ezekiel chapter 31, um, where the the article is given of Asher, and Asher has no article there. The word in the Hebrew is T-Asher, 
which is a plain old box cedar. That's all he amounts to, a fake, okay? But he always wanted to be so mighty, he never cut the mustard, okay? Verse 9, hell from beneath is moved for thee to meet thee at thy coming. It stirreth up the dead for thee, even all the chief ones of the earth. It hath raised up from their uh, thrones all the kings of the nations. One worldism all over. They made so much out of him. But what is he? When the truth really comes forth, what is he? This is the proverb. Verse 10. All they shall speak and say unto thee with one voice, see, art thou also become weak as we? Art thou become like unto us? You claim to be God. But it looks to me like God's putting you down. This is the proverb, my friend. We're talking about Satan. And you just become a, a nothing because God has power. Over, and if you were a true Christian, you would know that God has even given us power over Satan in the name of Jesus Christ. You don't have to put up with stuff from him. And anytime you scotch any move by the Kenites or anyone else that would try to... to, to uh, throw stones in the path of truth, we'll overcome it. We'll handle it. Okay? Why? Because God will give us the authority, the power, and the truth to see that it happens. Uh, but even let them speak all with one voice. That doesn't make it true. Okay? Verse 11, Thy pomp is brought down to the grave, and the noise of the vile. The worm is spread under thee. That old blanket is waiting for you there. And the worms cover thee. A big blanket of maggots right over. That, that's a de statement of degradation. Okay. It says that hell's waiting for you, buddy. Okay. That's, that's, that's what you're fit for and what your deeds have. That's what you've sown and that's what you're going to reap. Well, now, now who are we talking about? Verse 12. How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How art thou cut down to the ground, which didst weaken the nations, claiming to have one worldism? You know, Satan, well, I thought Jesus was the morning star. Satan always tries to take Christ's place. That's what the word Lucifer means. You know, in some of your newer translations, the word Lucifer is dropped. Uh, you know, why, why would some translator drop Satan's name so that a student would know exactly we're talking about Satan here? Well, let me figure that out for myself. Why would some scholar remove the name of Lucifer here? Because he works for Lucifer. That's why. Because he does Satan's work. Likes to mess with truth and claim they're all, always claim to be higher critics. The world is full of them, my friend. And uh, unfortunately, uh, many people listen to them. We don't. We'll stick to the Word of God. Satan is Satan. No, I don't care. You can paint him any color you want to. Rename him any way you want to. It's still Satan, the old dragon, the devil. And he will come as the Antichrist and deceive many especially the higher critics. They're already deceived. Well, they love it, though, because they work for him. Don't be deceived in this generation. Christ said, make a big sign about this and let everybody know, for it's going to come to pass. Verse 13, concerning Lucifer, For thou hast said in thine heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I'm better than they are. I will sit also up on the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. That's Mount Zion, the sides of the north, is where God's altar is. And this is why it's written in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 4, that Satan will come first before the true Christ sit in Jerusalem claiming to be God. 
claiming to be Messiah. You've been warned, friend. Oh, but brother, you don't understand. We're going to fly away. It's not written. Just not written. The only time we gather back to Christ is at the seventh trump. This happens at the sixth. What are you going to do through the sixth trump? You've got to wait till the seventh to join back to Jesus. And yet he never leaves us nor forsakes us because he gives us this truth, this word. Our Father is so very good to us that he would not leave us ignorant and exposed to the iniquity of Satan himself without having given us this warning. And you are warned. Verse uh, 15. Yet thou shalt be brought down to hell in the sides of the pit. And do you know what people are going to do through the millennium when he is locked away as it stipulates in Revelation chapter 20 that he is bound in the abyss, the pit, for a thousand years so that we can teach the misguided people never had a chance the real word of God as it is written in Revelation chapter 20 verse 5 that we will be priests there, those that know the truth. Well, what do priests do? Well, they teach, of course. And they teach with Christ. But what, what do these people say during that millennium as they look into that abyss? Verse 16, They that see thee shall narrowly look upon thee and consider thee, saying, Is this the man? Ish. Is this the ish that made the earth to tremble? That did shake kingdoms? He brought about one worldism? This miserable wretch that's in this abyss? This is what people worship? Yes. See that you don't, my friend. What did God say about this proverb? Make a huge sign. Be a watchman. Know that and, and you know, you might, if you're not familiar with it, rereading 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 might take on a whole new meaning because what it stipulates is let no man deceive you about our gathering back to the true Christ. It's not going to happen until after the son of perdition, Satan stands in the holy place claiming to be God. Okay. So you've been warned. No one understand that. We're warned throughout the word of God. When you teach chapter by chapter and verse by verse, and most of all, when you absorb chapter by chapter and verse by verse, let the seal of God, His truth, settle in your mind so that you're not tempted by, all my, by, by old Satan and therefore thus escaping the hour of temptation and be a watchman and serve God through that time. All right, bless your heart. You listen a moment, won't you please? Ezra and Nehemiah. These two books are necessary to understand the returning to the Father in that sense of the example set forth in the end times of the rebuilding of God's most favorite place on earth. Also, within these two books, you find the hidden secret, hidden from most people's eyes, that the study in the Hebrew and the Chaldee that is given in these particular books will teach you how that the priesthood itself became polluted during this period of time. This is to say about 400 years before Christ walked the earth to the time that he did walk, instructing you very wisely, setting the example of how it is that we gather back to Christ himself. Ezra and Nehemiah, fantastic. You'll enjoy them. And there we are back again. Let's have the 800 number, please. 1-800-643-4645. That number is good from Puerto Rico, throughout the U.S., Alaska, Hawaii, all over Canada. If the Spirit moves and you have a question, you share it. Won't you do that? Please never ask a question about a particular reverend or denomination. Let's don't judge people. Just teach God's Word, let the chips fall wherever they may. Never, never apologize for the Word of God. It is a warning. It is of love and understanding, whereby uh, this documenting itself that Father loves you because He doesn't want you tricked. He doesn't want you made a fool of. 
that gives him no pleasure. And um, uh, Father corrects his own because he loves them. And that's why these events happen to bring them back into line. Whereby, and at the same time, to love him is to have immunity to these things of the world because he will never leave you nor forsake you. Now, those of you that listen by short wave around the world, it's always a pleasure hearing from you. Your announcer at the end of the hour will give you our mailing address. You got a prayer request, you don't need that number, nor an address. Why? God knows what you're thinking right now. He loves you. He, he created you as it is written in Revelation chapter 4, the last verse, for his pleasure. And when you let him know you love him, it's, it pleasures him. And when you pleasure him, he's going to touch you. Whereby you have that understanding, that warning, where you're not made the fool of. Why? Because you're his child. He has, he has a use as watchman for his elect. Let him know you love him. Once you do that, Father, around the globe, we come, we ask that you lead, guide, direct, Father. Touch in Yeshua's precious name. Thank you, Father. Amen. Okay, and question time. We're going to go with uh, Sarah from Pennsylvania. Pastor Marie, God bless you and your family and staff. Question, is it a pagan riot to put lights on your house at Christmas? My son said I shouldn't decorate our house uh, and um, and this got cut to where I can't read. Please, please answer so we can get the right answer. Uh, well, uh, you know, what happened on December the 25th, which is Christmas Day? Uh, Christ's conception took place. And when Mary instantly at when the angel Gabriel finished talking with her, she went immediately to Elizabeth, the same day as the conception. And as she approached Elizabeth, John, who was six months in the womb of Mary's cousin Elizabeth, leapt because he felt the presence of the Holy Spirit. So when did Christ begin dwelling with us? On the day of conception. Now, he is the light. So if you're putting up the lights to celebrate the, the, the light of his coming, of his conception, that's fine. Don't let Babylon steal our joy. But don't worship at the same time or don't celebrate things for the wrong reason at the same time. Okay, Stick with the truth. Kim from Pennsylvania. I have a question to ask you. I know there is a chapter that if you read it, truly understand it, it tells you whether you are, are, whether you are or are not one of God's elect. If I'm not mistaken, I believe it was in John, but I'm not sure. Which one would that be? And please correct me if I'm wrong about the book. I can't think of a chapter in John I can think of many that ensures the fact that you are elect, but I can't think where of a chapter in John. Chapter 14 lets us know that he has prepared resting places for us and dwells with us, if you have eyes to see and ears to hear. But probably the, one of the main places where you would know whether you were one of God's elect or not, you will find in Romans chapter 11. Because... If, if you know that the false Christ is coming first, you've got eyes to see and recognize that. But otherwise, if you don't, God sends the spirit of slumber upon the rest whereby they can't see the truth. They will not be able to see it. And it's kind of for their own protection. Okay. But another chapter in that same book of Romans would be Romans 8 that is written especially to God's elect. They're called saints there, which means set aside ones. And he says in verse 26, you, you sometimes don't even know what to pray for. But I intercede in your life because I, 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 have, I have a purpose for you, because I foreordained you. That means I forepurposed you. I have a duty for you to do. I have a job for you to accomplish. And, and then he would continue on and, and say, all things work together to the good for those that love the Lord. And so it is. 
But uh, that's God's election. You can read again in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 4, where God says, I chose you before the foundations of this world, meaning this earth age. Well, because where did we come from? We came from God. And in the first earth age, Satan rebelled. And just as we stand against him today, giving no quarter, so did we then. So God didn't choose the elect because they're the best or the prettiest, but because they're people of action, can do type people. And God knows he can count on them. To believe is to live. And, uh, and so it is. Okay. Um, uh, um, Selena, okay, from Michigan. Watching series 194, the book of John, you stated, you started to explain that Passover was Jesus' birth, which somehow I was taught differently, but because your teachings mean so much to me and are so truthful, I was wondering if you could explain about Christmas and is it exactly what day? Well, uh, Christ was not born at Passover. Okay. He was crucified at Passover. His conception took place at Christmas, December the 25th. And his birth took place at the Feast of Tabernacles. And he was on the first day and he was circumcised the eighth. If you have a companion Bible, Appendix 179 gives you day by day concerning the conception and the birth of the Lord Jesus Christ. But uh, I'll, I'll go through that one more time. Uh, his conception took place on December the 25th. This is real easy figured by date from when John the Baptist, I'm sorry, John um, Zacharias in, in, the, in the book of Luke chapter 1, when Zacharias, Elizabeth's husband, who was a priest of the course of Abiah. That's a date. Okay. The course of Abiah is a date. And he was serving his course when the angel approached him and said Elizabeth would conceive. So that gives the birth date of John the Baptist. And we know that John the Baptist was born six months before Jesus Christ was. So this gives us the day of conception. Okay, uh, William, from um, the tape Christmas that I have in my library, you can order it. It'll help you out on that. William from Indiana, would you please explain to me a couple of things in referring to 2 Thessalonians 2, 2, and 3, chapter 2, verses 2 and 3. What's the difference in the day of Christ and the day of God and the day of the Lord? Well, the day of the Lord is, a, how, how long is the day of the Lord? That'll help you out. 2 Peter chapter 3, verses 7 and 8. Be not ignorant of this one thing, that one day with the Lord is as a thousand years with man. So the Lord's day is the millennium. Okay. And naturally, um, before the Lord's day, which he comes at the seventh trump, and that's the first day of the millennium, the first day of the Lord's day is at the seventh trump. And what you're being told in 2 Thessalonians 2, 3 is the, the falling away will, um, and I see that you have a question in 3, the word a falling away, has it been mistranslated as taken away? No, 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 no. The word in the Greek is apostasy. To apostatize means to, in one instant at the appearance of Antichrist, people are going to give up in a blink of an eye their professed beliefs and worship Satan. And many are, well, well now how could that be? Well, it's real simple. Very simple. It means exactly what it says. The falling away, the apostasy must take place. Why? Because when the Antichrist appears performing miracles in the sight of people, if you're not a believer, you're going to believe him. Because he can snap his fingers and lightning come down from heaven. That is written in Revelation chapter 13, verses 14, uh, 13 through 14, 15. All kinds of miracles to deceive, if it were possible, even the elect. But that's impossible because we're, we do not find him tempting. 
we find him rather to be an abomination, deceiving people, lying to people. And so it is. So, no, the, the falling away, check your strong concordance, apostasy. They change their minds instantly because they believe he's Christ. So they switch from worshiping the true Christ to worshiping Satan. Bam, just like that. Happens at the sixth trump. Um, Pastor Murray, David from Kentucky. My question is, I weigh about 220 pounds, and when I transfigure into my spiritual body, what will I weigh? Will I be weightless or weigh the same? Well, why, do, why are spiritual bodies called, in the Greek, pneuma, and in the Hebrew, ruach? What does pneuma mean? Well, it means air, okay? How much does air weigh? How much does ruach, which is to say air in the Hebrew tongue, you drive around on pneumatic tires, okay? That means they're pumped up with air. How much does that air weigh? So you're going to be light as a feather, all right? And just be able to buzz right along. Um, April from Wisconsin. You say if a church doesn't preach chapter by chapter and verse by verse, then that isn't the right church. I have learned so much from you. I went to a church and never could get it. He would preach five minutes of what he called the Holy Gospel, and then the rest would be a sermon. He's a good man, but I haven't been there for a while. A lot of stuff going on. I don't want to judge. Am I correct on what you said about a church should teach verse by verse, chapter by chapter? Also, I got a small bottle of oil. You, you have every right to have anointing oil and to anoint your home or whatever needs anointing, okay? It, and even to keep, as you say, unwanted spirits. I, I want to say, you know, an evangelist who brings people into the church does not necessarily teach chapter by chapter, and they can be topical teachers, which means they can have topics that they can utilize. But a pastor... Well, what is a pastor? Well, the word comes from pasture, where sheep graze. A pastor must feed the flock, and he must feed them the word of God. Not a bunch of malarkey, not a bunch of sermons that are uh, void of God's word, that is to say, not directly based on God's word. So if you're going to a, a home church, where you're not taught the Word of God, you're being robbed. Okay, that, that's just, I'm not judging, that's just a fact, okay? This is pretty obvious. Uh, Robert from Wisconsin. Pastor Arnold Murray mentioned that Jesus Christ was under another name and a body on earth during the Old Testament. Would you please tell me where in the Old Testament this is and what his other name was? Thank you. Well, you know, have you ever read the first chapter of John, first verse of John. In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God. The Word was God. And, and uh, what, who is Christ? He is God with us, Emmanuel. Okay. So w what you're talking about is Genesis chapter 14, verse 18, where Melchizedek appeared to Abraham, and Abraham worshipped him and tithed to him because he knew he was the Savior, okay? Uh, he knew he was the Lord or he would not have tithed to him. You got it? Um, and um, then in the New Testament, let's go there. Hebrews chapter 7, verse 3 declares that Melchizedek is as the Son of God. Why? Because he is the Son of God. Because Mel, what does Melchizedek mean? Melka, king, Zedek, of the just, righteous, the upright. Okay, There's only one. There's only one king of kings. And that is the Lord Jesus Christ. When, when you get a, a clue is back in, in uh, Genesis 14 where we know he had no mother, father, or no lineage. He just appeared. Okay. Hilda from North Carolina. 
if a person reads the Bible but doesn't understand it, will they still be saved? Well, if you believe that the Lord Jesus Christ is the Son of God and saved us, you're saved. Um, it is difficult. You, you, you have to understand some of what you're reading. The, you know, for a beginning student, this is one of the reasons I love the Companion Bible and highly recommend it. Why? It outlines the subject, the object, and the article that's being discussed in a, in a Companion uh, column. That outline, you know, when you begin to study anything, if you make yourself an outline, even if, if you're going to teach, it's good to have an outline to make your points, okay? But also this side column lets you know who the they's and the we's and the them's are so that you kind of get the subject and the object that's being discussed. And that's why I like, that. many people think that the Companion Bible is very deep. It isn't. Just because it utilizes certain Greek and Hebrew and Aramaic words in that side column, it definitely gives you the translation in English. But it is good to learn some of those languages that our word was originally written in. And uh, so read with understanding, but most of all, pray for understanding. Okay? Talk to the Father. Tell Him you want to understand better. And let Him touch you. Don't you do that? You do it. Marvin from Ohio, where in the Bible does it mention the word gulf? The word gulf, and I'm sure that you're talking about, is the gulf that's between those that overcome and those that don't make it. It's in paradise. And you'll, you'll read it in Luke chapter 16, verse 26. Luke 16, verse 26. Between the two, there is a gulf. You know, Luke was the writer of that great book, Luke. Luke's a light giver. But Luke was a medical doctor. He was a physician. And many of his terms are given in medical terms. And that word gulf is, in the Greek manuscripts, a medical term for a gapping wound, okay? That's how, as a student of God's Word, you can recognize Luke's work because the doctor kept coming through where he uses medical terminology. E.J. from Kentucky. Why did God scatter the ten tribes? What was the purpose for it? They, they, were, they, they were quite a ways away from Jerusalem, and they made golden calves and worshipped them instead of him. After he had parted the Red Sea, after he had fed them manna from heaven, after he had brought quail to them to eat flesh, took care of them out there in the desert and, and brought them into the promised land, tried to, had to let a generation die off. And then they go back to worshiping golden calves and Father says, I've had it. And in Jeremiah chapter 3, verse 8, he divorced her. God's a divorcee. He divorced Israel. But then, of course, when Christ passed away, he was free to remarry. And so it is uh, into the adoption because of, of they were wicked. Okay? They, needed, they needed a little education, and boy, did they get it. Teresa from Virginia, is there anything wrong with anointing myself? Of course not. If there is no one there to do it for you, then of course you can do it yourself, all right? But always, always do it in the name of Yeshua Messiah, Jesus the Christ, okay? And, and make talk to him. Let him know what you are anointing for. Is it for a healing? Is it for knowledge? Is it wisdom? Better understanding? What, what Talk to him. He'll give it to you if you ask. Okay. So um, if, it's, if it's to better understand and to love him, all right? Patricia from Tennessee. Can we be forgiven for first-degree murder? Well, uh, the answer is no, but I want to explain first-degree murder first because a lot of people do not understand the biblical connotation. A murder of passion is not first-degree murder. A murder um, that is not um, just out of pure, de wickedness 
is for, that just simply kill someone for the sake of killing. That is murder. Okay. Now, I want to make that very clear. Anything done in ignorance is not necessarily first degree murder, but God is judge. But it, when I say no, it is written in Deuteronomy chapter 19 that if a man lie in wait, that is to say wickedness and turn, he had nothing against this man. This man had done nothing to him, and he takes his life, then he must pay with his. Okay. If, if a man go to the timber to cut wood with a neighbor, and the axe fly from the handle and cut his head wide open and kill him, that's manslaughter, and the, he must go to a village of protection three cities away, whereby a member of the family of the deceased won't, in anger, take it out on him. So it's solved, okay? But Jesus himself says in the great book of Matthew uh, chan um, 5 or 6, which is it? Verse 21, you have heard that thou shalt not kill. That word kill is fognance. It means criminal homicide. He said if you do, you're going to perish. And naturally, in the epistles of John, chapter, uh, first epistle, chapter 3, verse 15, a murderer cannot have forgiveness in the flesh. Why? Because God is judge and they have to be sent to the Father to be judged. I'm out of time. Hey, you know what? I love you all because you enjoy studying our Father's Word. Most of all, God loves you for it. He truly does. It makes His day. And when you make His day, boy, is He going to make yours. You think about it. Uh, we are brought to you by your tithes and offerings. If we've helped you, you help us keep coming to you. Once you do that, bless God. He will always, as I stated, bless you. Most important, though, you listen to me. You stay in His Word every day in His Word. It's a good day, even with trouble. You know why? Because Jesus, Yeshua, He is the living Word. Hearing God's Word with understanding will change your life. We hope you have enjoyed studying God's Word here on the Shepherd's Chapel Family Bible Study Hour with Pastor Arnold Murray. If you would like to receive more information concerning Shepherd's Chapel, you may request our free introductory offer. Our introductory offer contains the Mark of the Beast audio tape, our monthly newsletter with a written Bible study, a tape catalog, and a list of written reference works available through Shepherd's Chapel. To request our free introductory offer by telephone, call 800 643 4645 24 hours a day. You may also request our introductory offer by writing to Shepherd's Chapel, Post Office Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas 72736. Once again, that's Shepherd's Chapel, Post Office Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas. 72736. We invite you to join us for the next in-depth Bible study each weekday at this same time. Thank you for watching today's program and God bless you.